uh, I would like to welcome you to this session on the future of energy, or maybe the energy of the future. We'll hear from our uh, panelists. Uh, this session is linked to our project on the new energy architecture. In the forum, we are very much looking at how there is a transition happening in the world of energy. And so it will be very interesting in hearing what our panelists today will tell us in terms of how is evolving the energy mix, how is work, uh, evolving the world of energy. So this panel will be moderated by our scientist and professor from the San Diego University. They're also a member of the Global Agenda Council on Energy Security. That is David Victor, and I will let David kick off and introduce our panelists. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Roberto. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, let me remind you to turn off your cell phones, please. And this session is open to the press. This is one of eight sessions that is looking at strategic shifts in major industries like in energy, infrastructure, consumption uh, over the course of today and then tomorrow there'll be a series of meetings looking at the implications of those shifts for investment, for governance and a variety of other uh, important topics. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to host this session on energy. Uh, energy used to be, if I can say, one of the dullest businesses on the planet. Uh, you'd wake up in the morning and you knew what you were going to do that day. Uh, you knew next year what the technologies were going to look like and so on. Today, in almost every aspect of the energy business, fossil fuels production, uh, non-fossil production, electric power networks, consumption, everything is changing. And we have today a panel that will help us understand those transformations which are truly profound. Let me briefly introduce our panelists, then each of them will make a few opening remarks. Uh, and uh, after those opening remarks, we'll have some discussion and open the floor for questions and answers. Um, uh, we'll have our first remarks from uh, Christy Clark, who is Premier of the British, uh, uh, Premier of British Columbia in Canada. Uh, Premier. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today um, and uh, have a chance. I'm the only politician here in a group of business people and academics, which makes me feel like a, a, a small and despised minority. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that government, uh, government does not create wealth, government doesn't create economic opportunity, government doesn't um, uh, really, uh, doesn't start business, but government can enable or impair the growth of an economy. And we have a responsibility as politicians to make sure that we are enabling as much as possible rather than impairing economic growth. And when it comes to energy, um, there are some major changes happening around the world. And I think it is going to be important for politicians and leaders to ensure that we are doing everything we can to enable the, the shifting energy landscape out there. So, for example, of course, in, uh, in Japan, the shift from nuclear, the use of nuclear energy is, uh, is, creating a, is creating a great change in the, in the requirements. The, uh, the five-year plan in China and its focus on, on clean energy, again, creating a major shift in, in the energy landscape out there. And in North America, it's the emergence of shale gas as, a, as an incredible opportunity for um, a new, cleaner fossil fuel. And um, we have a goal in British Columbia of five or of three uh, new natural gas processing plants, uh, LNG plants, on the coast by 2020. The first one by 2015. There's been very significant international interest in that, including from my friends at Mitsubishi, uh, Domo Arigato, for that. $2.9 billion of investment so far. And I think those are the things that, um, those are some of the changes that we need to be keeping our eye on, and I think governments have a central role to play in making sure we are allowing and enabling the private sector to meet those changing energy needs. We're very much focused on that, uh, on that in British Columbia, particularly as the, as the growth and demand changes around the world, and there's a shift um, also in the kinds of energy that, uh, that are being demanded by various markets. Thank you, David. Great. Well, thank you very much for those very helpful comments. And next, we'll hear from your friends at Mitsubishi. Uh, next, we have uh, remarks from Yorihiko Kojima, who is chairman of the board of the Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, chairman Kojima. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And th thank you very much, Premier. <laughs> uh, when I look at the future of energy, and uh, I anticipate a continued 
a uh, say structural shift in the uh, energy mix uh, that the, uh, the uh, used to be the demand on from fossil fuels centric to the uh, renewable energy centric and uh, for that to happen we all have to be uh, very mindful of elements uh, such as the uh, economic efficiency and also the uh, stable energy supply and uh, the impact of the uh, global environment. Those are very important. The environment that around, surround the uh, topics of energy has gone through the uh, several changes in recent two years. And uh, I would like to take up uh, three major ones today. First one is uh, the global economic is now slowing down. The second one is the change in the efforts to respond to the uh, global warming. And uh, the third one, the impact of Fukushima nuclear power plant accident that occurred the uh, last year, uh, March 11th. First, uh, there is a growing consensus that would uh, economic growth to stay as low as uh, around the, uh, maybe uh, 3%. Uh, GDP growth for some time. The weak global economy will preclude any strong growth of uh, fossil fuel demand. And uh, if uh, you put together uh, this with the uh, fa fact that the uh, shale gas production uh, in North America and Canada, of course, and uh, elsewhere is growing, and you can expect less risk of uh, soaring fossil fuel prices. And uh, unless uh, we came to the, uh, face some major geopolitical event, maybe there is something uh, may happen there. And uh, secondly, uh, regarding efforts to address uh, global warming, I have an impression that CO2 reduction has gone down in the list of priorities for the governments these days. And uh, developed countries are struggling with uh, tight budgets. Also, I hear some people uh, arguing that the uh, scientific basis for the causes of global warming should be scrutinized more carefully. And uh, the point is the thirdly, regarding the impact of Fukushima nuclear power plant accident, many countries uh, continue, to ish, continue to use this nuclear power. And uh, however, uh, except some of the countries, uh, they stopped the, uh, to use the nuclear power. And uh, even in countries that are still using nuclear power there, public debate has resumed on topics such as the uh, need to review safety standards and the uh, approach, appropriate disposal of the uh, radioactive waste. And the growing debate and the objection may uh, uh, create, say, hesitation, the continued use of nuclear power plant. And as a country where the accident actually happened, say, Japan has the responsibility to carry out a thorough and complete analysis of the event and to establish a proper safety standard based on the uh, findings. That's a very, very important. Then analysis and uh, say studying uh, of the uh, Japanese government is now underway, and uh, we do expect a, uh, some message will be uh, coming out. So these are some of the major changes that surround the world energy uh, scene today, and uh, they make the shift from the uh, fossil fuel to renewable energy more challenging. I believe we would need to assign a bigger role to natural gas, including shale gas. And the likely scenario is that yeah, during the next decade or two, we will mainly, depending upon the uh, increased production of the natural gas, and if possible, also on nuclear power generation, so long as the safety, safety can be uh, ensured. That is also very important. To me. During the time, we need to invest in uh, technological innovations that lead to cost reduction and stable supply of renewable energy. And then after that, the use of renewable energy will become more widespread, making it one 
of the leading energy sources uh, in the energy mix. So those are my thoughts on the energy supply side. But the, the other side is uh, technical innovation and the government policies are equally important on the uh, demand side. And uh, a, uh, if we hope to make any serious progress in energy conservation, well, in Japan, as you may know, both the private and the public sectors got serious about energy conservation after the oil shock, you may remember, in the 1970s. This sets Japan under the road to becoming one of the most energy efficient countries. The initiatives taken at the time have also helped us to uh, curtail CO2 emissions. Now, having uh, dealt with the uh, Fukushima nuclear accident, Japan is uh, once again uh, faced with the uh, challenge in energy. We must exhibit even greater innovation and uh, creativity to develop a new energy mix that is safe, reliable, and sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those, uh, for those remarks. Uh, next on our panel, we'll hear from Daniel Jurgen, uh, who is chairman of IHS CIRA, the leading uh, energy consultancy and also author, most recently, of The Quest, which was published in Chinese on, uh, on Saturday. Dan? Thank you very much. Uh, I think if we are looking very short term, following from Mr. Kojima says, and we look at the oil price, we would say, hearing all the economic news uh, and analysis that we hear at this uh, Davos conference, we would say the oil price should not be $115 a barrel. But it is reflecting the tension between, on the one hand, uh, a, a, a slowed economy, but even in the last session we heard as a potential double dip, uh, but at the same time, the tension around Iran, the question of sanctions, and I would just say that uh, this is not a stable situation with Iran, uh, and uh, this whole mechanism of the sanctions, uh, we're in very uncharted waters, and so I think you should uh, expect that some things will probably change in six months to a year. On the question of the future transitions, uh, that's some work that we're doing uh, with the uh, World Economic Forum as part of the energy community. And I think a conclusion uh, that we come to is uh, one that surprises people. Maybe it's not what they want to hear, but energy transitions don't come fast. Uh, the lead time in energy is just much longer, and I think this is something that the venture capital community has discovered. There's no question that we've had a rebirth of renewables. I think it's fair to say wind is not alternative anymore. Wind is another form of conventional generation of electricity. The renewable business has become a global business. Last year is about $150 billion, but it's still small when you look at it in terms of the overall scale of the uh, energy industry. And uh, something that we found, we're doing research now, a, a project on the future of coal in China. And one of the things that really struck us when you say, since 2010, ask yourself the question, what's been the biggest growth in energy? And you probably might say it might be solar or something like that. But of course, it's been coal. And it's the growth of coal on an energy basis is 10 times uh, the growth of, uh, say, renewables. So wind has grown a lot. But uh, what we see is the conventional energy. So transition will take longer. Uh, but there are a couple of things to say. One is that uh, we do have a globalization of innovation. Mr. Kojima talked about it. The needs are urgent. I think Japan is going to kind of push to the forefront of energy innovation again. And certainly in terms of battery and uh, electricity storage, which is critical for renewables, I know Christina is really the expert on that, and we'll be able to learn from her on that. So the other thing I just want to talk about, and it's um, – it's a footnote to you, uh, Madam Premier, but a large footnote. You talked about Canada and the awesome role that British Columbia will play in the global gas market. Uh, this shale gas revolution uh, to the south of you in the United States has really been extraordinary. It was 20 years that it was going on, the innovation. No one paid attention to it. People thought it was a joke. Another five years to implement it. Then 2008, after 25 years of innovation, it burst out. And it is probably the biggest single innovation in the energy scene just because of the scale of it and the impact of it. It's gone from being 2% of U.S. natural gas to 40%. Almost instead of the U.S. being about to spend $100 billion importing LNG, the political debate in the country is about uh, exporting it. It's now carried over to oil, 
So U.S. oil production is up 25 percent. And it's amazing that we're now having a debate in the United States, a political debate that would have been unthinkable, a debate about how much the U.S. should be, like British Columbia, an exporter of energy uh, rather than an importer of energy. And our political discussion has changed towards that. It's had one other impact because coal, uh, natural gas has pushed coal out of electric generation in the United States. Of course, the coal is being exported to other places like China. Uh, U.S. CO2 uh, emissions have fallen much more uh, rapidly than had been uh, expected, and that's one of the unexpected uh, consequences of it. But I think big question now, and it's a big question for China and around the world, uh, is this primarily a North American phenomenon, or is this going to be a global phenomenon? And that's a subject certainly uh, worthy of some serious discussion. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much. Um, and we'll, I think in the discussion we'll come back to this issue of whether and how gas, uh, shale gas scales, because I think that's very, very important. Uh, next on our panel, we have Christina Lampa Onrud. Um, she is founder and international chairman of Boston Power. And as Dan mentioned, Boston Power is a key player in batteries, which are so important to many of the kinds of innovations we, we're talking about in the energy business today. Christina? Thank you. So it's fascinating. We sit here to discuss energy. I started a company seven years ago where people were just merely recognizing the revolution of mobility. And having an opportunity to play a role as we slowly transform our markets and our use and our thinking around energy has been truly remarkable, actually. When we look at sustainable systems and the fact that we need to basically integrate new innovation with existing infrastructure and existing energy paradigms, the question is no longer local, no longer, not national, but global, and that makes, of course, the challenge bigger. But the opportunity is so incredible to me as we recognize climate change and we recognize economic upside with cheap energy, having learned a little bit from the last 50 years what that meant for strong growth economies, to now think about not only global supply chains but also almost like Lego pieces where you have renewable energy from solar and from wind, from geothermal and from water sources to be stored to take care of off and on peak hour demand where you can basically generate sustainably, store and augment the energy paradigm that we live in. I agree also it will take a long time before we have a shift, but I think it's so incredibly important that we think of technologies that are here today to offset our carbon footprint and the 11 other gases that are harmful to the earth at the same time as we deploy these new technologies together. So the thought that we could basically leverage existing infrastructure and energy and renewables can come in and offset some of the biggest downsides, take just the peak hours between typically 4.30 or 5 till 8.30 to 9 p.m. daily where people come home from their work industry is still running, there is typically a peak in every economy. Once the electric transport becomes very large, you actually have energy storage inherently in your car, in your garage, where you could in principle run your household from a large battery that you haven't used everything for transportation, or where you were away at work, capture some of the solar power and stored it for your use just those few hours. Or even think about the opportunity that each one of us become an energy trader in some level by just monitoring use. So the revolution of knowledge, the opportunity of hyperconnectivity and transparency where we actually know how we use energy, what it actually costs, and the stimulant of this global discussion of global economies, I think will spur innovation and innovators and new collaborations at a pace that we have never seen before. Great, thank you very much. And for the last of our opening comments, and then we're going to go to a discussion with the panel and uh, a discussion with all of you, uh, we have Lin Bocheng, who's the director of the China Center for Energy Economics uh, Research, a leading uh, uh, institute in China working on all matters of the Chinese energy system, and is also chairman of the Global Agenda Council on Energy Security here at the World Economic Forum. Lin? 
Thank you. <clears throat> I just follow on the topic of innovation. Uh, we all know that innovation is the whole key to the future are uh, new energy, such as solar and wind power. And uh, innovation is a key because it can lower cost of uh, new energy, and which is particularly important for developing countries to be able to utilize the, the new energy, solar and power in a larger scale. Uh, now let me give you an example. Uh, we all know that China coal-fired coal power plant provide about 80% of electricity. And we know it's not good. So about a few years ago, Chinese government began to discourage coal-fired power plant uh, investment. And we see the very good results. There has been coal-fired power plant investment has been de declined continuously for about six years in a large quantity. We're supposed to be happy, right? But now, now we begin to worry about that the coal-fired power plant decline might be too much. And the reason for that is that the, new, the solar and power with so-called new energy are incremental. It's not sufficient to cover the incremental of demand and most of the loss in the coal-fired power share. Wind and solar together provide about less than 2% of the electricity in China. And if we now we begin to worry about if the trend of the coal-fired power plant investment decline continuously. In about three years, China is going to face a huge power shortage. So now we might have to begin to go back to encourage coal-fired power plant investment. So now, now give us an uh, idea that the, the new technology, the wind and solar, not only need to be cost, need to be lower, and also need to be developed in a large quantity to, to, to meet the incremental demand and also to uh, whatever we want to replace. Now, how do we do that? I think that uh, up to this point that uh, we are seeing that a lot of uh, trade problems, trade uh, conflict, there's an invest investigation on the wind and solar ongoing uh, from the United States and also Europe. I would suggest that the possibility an uh, international alliance in terms of the how to support wind and solar, the new energy technology, not, from, not just from a point of economic growth, also need to from a point of how to address CO2 issue altogether, globally. And because it is important is that because due to the tra recent trade tra uh, problems, it's going to slow down, it's going to hurt everybody. It's going to slow down the solar and wind industry substantially. Now, follow this point, how do we do that? I think there might be a need to, dis to distinct a bit between the old technology and the new technology. Maybe we can provide a more tolerance and more space for the new technology. I'm not saying that we don't have to follow the rule and regulation under international trade, but can we make a slight distinction between the two, such that we can support this new industry not only in terms of technology flow, also in terms of the flow in a large quantity. Of course, by doing that, we need the government and private sector all get together. And I, I think this is an important issue, and also it's a criti <coughs> critical issue need to be addressed now. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna start with a couple questions to the panel. Uh, overall, we're gonna have a discussion up here, and I would urge you, who want to ask a question to get your question ready, because I'm going to turn to the audience in just a moment. The first theme I'd like to pursue is innovation. Everybody in their remarks in a different way talked about innovation, the role of companies, the role of the government in this, uh, and so on. So I want to start with you, Dan. Uh, earlier you, you wrote a book about really the relationship between government and private industry and uh, how that relationship is managed. And I'm wondering if you could comment about what needs to be done on innovation. Uh, the Western countries right now, all of them it seems are in serious uh, financial trouble. Uh, there's going to be some role for the government to spend money on innovation. There's going to be some role for new regulations and so on. Yet it seems like government is just struggling to survive. So help us start to think about what could be done to radically improve the rate of innovation in the energy business. Well, I, I headed a task force on energy R&D uh, during the Clinton administration where these questions, and the thing one struck is how funding goes up and down. 
So, uh, and we can see it now, we've had a, in the U.S. a big surge of spending and a notion of uh, really creating frontier research centers, and now it's, that funding is threatened. So I think the era of austerity puts a lot of pressure on this whole thing, because part of, obviously, a really critical role of government is to support, in a sustained basis, that kind of first part of energy R&D, so people can make careers in that, and the up and down is not good for that. The other thing is that, of course, uh, innovation comes from large organizations, it comes from universities, it comes from individuals with ideas, it comes from people who have ideas that other people regard as crazy, and we've seen it again and again. And just the story of shale gas is very interesting. It was basically one person who for 15 years believed this was possible, and the people working for him said, George, you're wasting your money, you're wasting your time. But he said, it's my money and I, my time, and I'll continue to do that. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, what occurred. So I think there's not a, a single recipe ex except to, to allow a lot of space for that, for different ideas to uh, persevere and uh, to uh, create a, a sustained platform so that, uh, the, you know, I'll just end by this. You know, in the quest, I said that we're not, we'll see a lot of growth in renewables and alternatives, but the point that uh, others have made is that the overall energy mix will grow and so that the changes probably come after 2030. But those changes, the big changes, will be the result of things that are happening now. So it is a 20 or 30 year lead time, and that's why, you know, maintaining that commitment, and that's going to be tough during an age of austerity. Uh, yeah, I, well, I think there, there are a couple of experiences we have. Um, one is um, we are the only, we were the first jurisdiction in North America to um, introduce a carbon tax, and it was essentially a tax shift. We reduced um, uh, personal income tax and business taxes by the same rate that we, uh, so that you know, we, uh, we, it ended up being a, a revenue neutral to government. We thought that that showed great leadership. We had a serious problem of followership in British in North America <laughs> after doing that. So, uh, but it has made a real difference in terms of attracting clean energy businesses to British Columbia. That's an example of something government can do, where you're really um, you're creating a shift in behavior without adding to the total tax burden. Um, the other, I think, the point about investments in universities is a very, very good one. And so, University of British Columbia set a goal to be in the top 25 universities. Um, government invested very heavily in the university, and now I think it's top 21 or 22 in the world, leading in innovations in clean tech. The third point I would make around shale gas is we have set a goal to have the cleanest LNG in the world. So we want our LNG plants to be principally fueled by renewables. That's going to, now we're a, we're a hydro, we have a lot of hydro uh, electricity in our province. It won't be enough. It's going to drive, we hope, a huge boom in investment in um, renewable technology across the province um, we, that we hope will attract investment. So again, what we're trying to do is create a private sector market for clean and renewable energy. And it will be driven, we hope, uh, by shale gas, and we hope that Ultimately, those innovations will be innovations that will be exported around the world so that everybody can be producing uh, uh, clean gas. So let me ask Christina, you're, you've started a company whose economic logic in part is rooted in the concerns about climate change and shifting to uh, alternative energy sources, in this case onboard storage and electrification of vehicles. H how do you survive in a world where the government thinks it's poor where we're not doing followership, followership in the United <laughs> States on climate change policy. But what are you looking for from, from government to help boost the kinds of innovations that you've been working on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I started the company in 2005 uh, with the realization that innovation in storage was very mediocre. Percentages increase of energy density. Energy density was all that drove that market. And uh, with the recognition that if you made a step change in energy density tuned into cost and allowed fast charge, you would basically shift the paradigm. And then safety and green was actually equally important on our design agenda. When the economic crisis of 2008 hit the company, where we already had revenues from HP, Lenovo, and Asus Tech in the laptop industry and also in the medical portable electronics market, had just started uh, qualifying into transport. Frankly, China's long-term strategy was 
an unbelievable opening to us. So we were in China day one to partner with global supply chain and manufacturing. Uh, I had a vision early on that if you can transform the paradigm of cost performance, and I think this is really important to make as a point, in the end, renewables will compete on a dollar per kilowatt hour. And it's in finished packs. And we had a way to do that with chemistry, mechanical engineering, and the electronics. So basically a finished block that can interact with the device. We had a chance to do it in China in a way that couldn't, frankly, be done in the United States or Europe at the time because China had set out for the same reasons that you mentioned in your opening remarks. For the last seven years, every five-year plan says we have an energy problem in China. We will solve it, and we're committed. We didn't take government funding, nor from the United States or Europe or China. We got operating offset of capital in China, but it's really all the subsidies are going into end markets. <clears throat> and just maybe an illustration, if I may, to illustrate how simple that policy can be. So the mayor of Beijing says, I would like to have electric vehicles. And let me formulate that in a way so everybody can understand. If you want to buy a gasoline-driven car in Beijing today, you enter into our lottery. And then if you win, you can drive every other day. If you buy an electric car, you're welcome to drive immediately. And it helps Beijing with the noise factor, the pollution factor, the particulate factor. And it drives a market opportunity, and the subsidies actually go into the market, not as Europe and the United States elected to bet on companies. Mm -hmm. So that's a better policy from an entrepreneur and innovator's point of view, because it makes the capital bets much shorter. Let's talk about China's role in this. Um, there's a terrific article on China's energy innovation system, written by Evan Osnos in The New Yorker about two years ago. Just a lovely article. Um, we've just heard from Christina of your experience with innovation and the role of China strategy in this area. And so help us understand, Lin Bocheng, does China have an advantage in this area of innovation, long-term innovation, especially in energy, that frankly other countries don't have? And, and what is China's role going to be in the international landscape of, of energy innovation? I think that for China at this point, uh, the most important advantage is, is the market. Large incremental uh, in terms of energy uh, demand is uh, really in China. So the market itself will provide sufficient encouragement and most of potential for any innovation in investment in the, in the new, new technology and innovation in that perspective. The second one is the cost of research uh, is relatively cheap in China. And uh, given that the gap of technology is really not a farther part in the new, new energy technology, I think that China get a, a very good uh, potential uh, at this point. Uh, but what I'm still worried about is that uh, given current situation, uh, it's really not good for the, for the new energy industry uh, at this point. Normally, the innovation will require funding, and funding from come from both at least two major sources. One is from government. Given the uh, past experience uh, I have been observed uh, in China, is that the government, central government, were, haven't done much, actually. There's an investment in the innovation, but really not that much in terms of the scales. The local government are really interest, more interested in equipment because they come quickly. So the result is the innovation funding is, uh, is really are uh, lacking at this point in China. And we're hoping that the situation will change in the future. The second source of funding obviously comes from enterprises. But the, but the precondition that the company have to make money to, to have the investment in the innovation. But if you look at the wind, wind power and solar, particularly at this point, they are all fighting for survivals. Mm -hmm. So 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 put put two together, uh, the, the given the Given that the China's advantages, uh, we still have to do a lot uh, to encourage the, the innovation. And while you have the floor, let me just press you on one aspect of innovation in China, which concerns shale gas. Um, everybody in different ways has been talking about shale gas. You can't go to an energy meeting anywhere in the world today without shale gas being, it's like a love-in about shale gas. And I'm wondering if you could comment 
about the potential for these innovations to spread in China. You, in your opening remarks, talked about the difficulty China's had in reducing incentives to build coal. And in the United States, the big impact of shale gas has been to shift from coal to natural gas and electric power generation. How quickly should we expect these innovations to spread in China, shale gas innovations, and what needs to be done to accelerate that? I think that if China really determined to go for the shale gas, uh, the technology is a problem right now, but can be addressed very quickly, uh, given the uh, past experience in other energy sectors in China. They usually can do it very quickly. But, the, but there's a problem with shale gas. Uh, one is that, as a major one, is the water. If you ask me uh, what is the most scarce resource in China, I would say water, not energy. Okay? And anything you have to compete with the water, you certainly will lose. So uh, given the water situation, the cell gas technology really need to be improved further to make sure that uh, we do not uh, consume too much water. And until that time, I think that China will, have, uh, have, will move much more quickly. Right. But I think that in about two to three years, I wouldn't believe that there will be a huge movement there. Let me ask one more question to Mr. Kojima. In your remarks, you talked about Fukushima, and obviously, uh, the situation in Fukushima is, is, is uh, terrible. Um, a year and a half ago, if we had a panel discussion that talked about the future of energy and concerns about climate change and so on, lots of people would be talking about nuclear power. Fukushima has changed that. A year and a half ago, when, when someone is asked, what's the country that's done the best job of scaling up nuclear power, Japan would be, if not the top country in the list, the top two country in the list. Fukushima has changed that. What should the rest of the world learn from Japan's experience uh, with Fukushima? And as chairman of Mitsubishi, what is your outlook for, for reactors outside of Japan? Obviously, there's a special situation in Japan, but the nuclear revolution really concerns other countries. What's your outlook on that? Well, a uh, nuclear power plant situation in Fukushima. And uh, what the government is doing is that they are now analyzing why this happened and also uh, they are studying how to protect this in the future. And the next one is the, uh, uh, also uh, how to make the uh, security standard for future. And also and they are studying the uh, energy best mix for future in Japan. This message is also very important to the uh, all countries in the world. And uh, uh, we are waiting and still they are analyzing. But uh, it's not so easy. They are now communicating with the, uh, in the government, also in the industries level, and also the uh, academia level, is the university level. And the communication is uh, very, very important. Therefore, we are expecting that to, some message from Japan will be very much uh, helpful all throughout the world, I think. And uh, say, a uh, nuclear power plant is uh, very, very important from the uh, cost viewpoint. And also from the security viewpoint, if we can fix the uh, analyze and the standard level, and uh, I think we can protect this kind of things mm -hmm. again. And uh, therefore, it may take some more time. And uh, uh, now the nation's uh, em emotional movement, <laughs> it's uh, a bit difficult to yeah, understand. Therefore, uh, but uh, it may take time, but uh, I do believe the, uh, some good message will be coming out. And uh, then under such circumstances, we, I always said, uh, talking about the energy, the three important points is uh, one is the technology, and the second is the cost. The third is the uh, time frame. Always we are looking at those things. And uh, as you may know, say Japan is the uh, maybe advanced country for the energy issues. <laughs> And uh, therefore, even our company is uh, working for the sometimes, uh, say, uh, electricity for the nuclear power, but uh, also we are heavily involved with the renewable energy. And also, our company is the, uh, involved in the LNG business throughout the world. And uh, we do hope shale gas will be of great help, uh, of course, for Japan and for throughout the world. Mm -hmm. From the viewpoint of the technology and the cost, and also the time frame, it may take not so long time, but these kind of things are very important. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now we have time for a number of questions from the audience. Uh, who would like to uh, raise a question? Back here on the right-hand side, I think a microphone right in the middle. You have the tallest hand, so you win. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor and director at the University of Queensland in Australia in the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Um, I'm uh, curious to hear the panelists' views on uh, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy uh, Association Agency, which was just established last year as an international entity, and also the Energy Charter Treaty. Are these um, efforts of likely to be of much use uh, in, the, in, in this planning phase, or is this really very much a macro-level effort with not much relevance on the ground? Would somebody like to say something nice about IRENA or the Energy Charter Treaty? That's silence. What about you, David? I, I think it's, um, well, this is on the record, so let me change what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> I think these activities follow what's going on in the markets. They don't lead. I think the Energy Charter Treaty was designed to advance investment in one country, Russia, and that country has been the least involved with this, and we have lots of struggles with bilateral investment arrangements already around the world, witness the judgments against Argentina that have not been collected on. And I think IRENA is largely a place where people can talk about what's happening in the renewable energy industry, but the fundamentals in that industry are the things that the panelists have been discussing. They've been innovation in batteries, cheap gas, which is disastrous for a lot of the renewable energy industry, and um, fiscal austerity, um, which is a big, big problem for a lot of this industry. Another uh, comment. Or question. Right here, in, right here in front, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Master from Japan. I have a small question to Mr. Kojima. You talked about uh, the oil shocks of the 1970s and Fukushima shocks. And recalling after the oil shock 70s, Japan became a completely new country. Mm. And we, we got a lot of innovation and ideas. So, what would be the impact of Fukushima? Japan will be reborn again and could send good messages and lessons to the world. What would be the lessons and messages Japan could send to the world after Fukushima? Thank you. Thank you very much. I have the same opinions. <laughs> now this is the timing for Japan to reborn. <laughs> and, uh, because, uh, uh, say, we have already studied the renewable energy, of course. But uh, renewable energy, the problem is the, uh, uh, the cost and also time frame and also the technology is getting better, but the uh, uh, feed-in tariff system is very, very expensive <laughs> and for the government. But uh, therefore, uh, total, say, uh, gap of the uh, nuclear power plant cannot be covered by the nuclear power <laughs> in Japan. Therefore, now the time for Japan to uh, reorganize, uh, reconsider what's the best uh, energy mix in Japan for future. But uh, it may take some more time. That is my understanding. And uh, some, somebody says, forget nuclear power. No, it's not so easy for to forget. And uh, however, the energy best mix and uh, should be and uh, nuclear power will be reducing, and uh, this will be covered by the uh, LNG for the time being, and for the long term basis, a nuclear power plant. Oh, no, 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 renewable energy plant. And uh, therefore, now I think it's uh, timing for Japan to recover, to reborn, to reconsider. Can, can I just press you a little more on that question? What is Japanese industry going to do about the cost, though? Because uh, imported LNG is priced basically against oil. There's also a significant amount of oil in the, in the mix. Your factories are competing against Chinese firms that have a much lower cost basis. At some point, this seems very, very difficult to sustain. How, how is the industry going to respond? Uh, yeah, as you may know, say, uh, Japanese industry is uh, uh, heavily involved in how to make the uh, energy saving manufacturing. And also, Japan is a non-resource country. Therefore, we are importing the uh, resources from outside for a long time. Therefore, under such uh, circumstances. 
and uh, what's the best way? Every industry is seriously thinking about. Some of the industries may go out from Japan to the uh, outside, but uh, most of them are still st staying in Japan to manufacturing uh, the products uh, based upon the uh, a little bit higher energy, but uh, make it the more competitive price, and they are always starting. Mm -hmm. That is Japanese manufacturers, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Another question. Uh, right here, sir. And then the next one will be. Hi. You're going to get two microphones in a moment. There. Hello. Uh, I'm Johan Bartz, Minister of uh, Economy of Estonia. And probably I'm a question to Mr. Jergin, but maybe also Mrs. Clark can respond a little bit. And uh, the question is about the oil shale. You talk about this revolution which is now happening, shale gas. Uh, you had a very good sentence that uh, there was a man who wasted time and money, but now he, he, shale gas is there and, and we, everybody is looking at the potential, also in Europe. Polish doing a lot of work, etc. But the shale oil, or oil shale, I am asking because Estonia is one of the countries who are really using the oil shale, we are producing oil. We all know that this conventional oil is going uh, more expensive uh, and, and uh, Canadians using uh, sand oil. Biggest reserves of the oil shale are in the United States. 75% of all the reserves of the oil shale are existing in the United States. What is, how you see the next 10 years? Because we all know that the demand of the oil will increase. What is going to happen with the oil shale? Right. I'm not just uh, uh, want to underline or, or importance of the renewables, but, but especially this is... Yeah, how much, what do you produce? I know you produce in Estonia, but how much do you produce? And not significantly comparing the world demand, but uh, we, we're really developing now, uh, uh, and we produce uh, 20,000 barrel a day, something like right. that. Also China is go more and more using the oil shale, but the but, but United States not... And the question is, what, what, what is, uh, uh, will be in the next five to ten well, years? First, let me clarify one thing. There's oil shale, which is what you're talking about, which is the kerogen, which is the uh, immature oil, and there's shale oil, which is what is produced using the same technique as shale gas, and it's really, we call it tight oil, but so it's, to begin with, it's confusing. So just to make it clear that I'm not talking about shale oil, but I'm talking, you're talking about oil shale. And the United States has immense deposits of this. Uh, way back in 1917, National Geographic wrote an article saying how uh, at that time the world was going to run out of oil, which has happened several times since then. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was going to be oil shale production was going to be uh, what everybody was going to get their gasoline from. Uh, and there was a big boom uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And then it turned out that it ended abruptly in 1982 because of the costs. So oil shale in the United States has just been pushed off. There were water problems, there were environmental problems. Uh, today, there are some companies uh, who are trying to still find new technologies to develop it at scale in, I think, Utah and Colorado. Uh, there's a project in Israel also uh, using that same technology. But you'd have to say this is very uh, uh, early. And the fact that you've had this shale oil, tight oil, come along, and suddenly, you know, the biggest growth in oil production in any country in the world since 2008 has been the United States, that that tends to push off the oil shale. And again, it's a question of people, you know, being committed and spending R&D dollars. And so in our own numbers, when we do reserves, we think at some point this will be exploited, but it doesn't see, you know, it's still something that's quite down, quite down the road compared to these other things, except uh, in Estonia where you're a pioneer. Uh, well, just to give you a sense of um, how, I mean, I agree with you, Dan, that it's often the, it is often the future. For us, we're talking about, by 2020, being net exporters, 40 trillion cubic meters of, um, or cubic feet, rather, of, of liquefied natural gas. We will be in the top five in the world. It is a, it's the equivalent, um, in energy terms, um, for shale gas of the, of the export from the Alberta oil sands today. 
So it's a, it's a very, very, very large project, economic project for us. And so the, uh, the tight oil or the, uh, or the, shale, the shale oil is, uh, is something that it's very difficult, I think, at this point to predict its future, given how quickly not just Canada, but other countries around the world are moving into gas and the appetite that we're seeing for the use of gas in countries like, uh, like Japan, Korea, an appetite, of course, in China and India. Um, I think for the next little while, that's where the action is yeah, going to be. Right, but I, I should add, I mean, obviously China, too, has an oil shale industry that goes back to the 1930s, and uh, I think maybe somebody here will know how much development effort it's gone into it, but just to, you say a very little bit, but just to add, the resource of uh, this oil shale in the United States, I mean, it's huge. It's sometimes measured at 7 trillion barrels. It's just uh, beyond the cost curve of everything else right now. Question back there, please. Uh, this is Bing Song. I'm from China Business News, the Caijing Rebao. And I have a question for Mr. Yerjin and Mr. Kojima and Mr. Lin Boqiang. So we, we can see that the global energy structure and the landscape keeps changing. And when we look into the future, I'm wondering, do you have, have you ever th thought about what will be the greatest risk we will face in the future in the field of energy? And what will that risk imply, maybe in both political and economic perspectives? Mm. Thank you. Maybe we could start well, with, I think with Mr. Kojima. Should start. <laughs> Mr. Kojima, what's the, what's the biggest risk in this long-term energy future? Well, uh, the biggest risk in the energy issues for a long time, maybe that is the question, right? Okay. And, it's what? And, hmm? and, okay, then uh, my response is uh, every country is now, say, using the energies in the very high level. Uh, therefore, nine, two, 2050, almost 35% total energy volume will be increasing. And I heard that for that sense, uh, uh, the other one is the uh, saving energy side, demand side. But supply side is uh, very, very important in that sense to keep the uh, economic level and uh, throughout the world. And for that purpose, uh, number one is the uh, fossil fuels. And uh, of course, even in the coal is a very, very important resources. And uh, in Japan, we are now analyzing the uh, carbon captured storage technologies, mm -hmm. how to reduce the uh, CO2, even from the coal. Mm -hmm. And also from the crude oil. And we are seeing, uh, doing the same things. And the long-term basis, and uh, those important resources is how to save the, uh, say, uh, CO2 level and the lower. And uh, the second one is the uh, very important resource is uh, uh, LNG. And the LNG is a liquefaction natural gas. And also, this is, in that sense, uh, oil gas and the oil shale, uh, not oil gas, shale gas and shale oil. Both of them are very, very important. And under such circumstances, how to protect those energy issues? Uh, also, we have to analyze the, uh, say, nuclear power plant technology more. And uh, uh, technology level should be analyzed, and uh, the nuclear power plant technology should be getting more important. That is my understanding. Mm -hmm. How to make those total energy best mix? Uh, is, that's very uh, important, but uh, in that sense, Renewable energy, it may take some more time, but in Japan, talking about the renewable energy, best renewable energy in Japan is the wind power and the geothermal. Therefore, country by country, renewable energy is different. And in Japan, not so strong solar power. <laughs> Therefore. Thank you very much. Lin Bo-Chang, what, uh, what's the biggest risk in the future? I think that, uh, <clears throat> in my view, there will be price. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that uh, now they go back to innovation. If somehow we can manage to have a technology breakthrough to bring down the new energy cost substantially, 
Otherwise, no matter who, what subsidy what, the energy cost is going up. And also, if you begin to look at the trouble spot, uh, you know, the, the tensions uh, also point to energy costs. I'm not sure that. From economic point of view, I don't believe going to, we are going to use up energy. I don't think so. It's just that a cost that which maybe that is going to be uh, unaffordable to poor. And also, very likely that energy price is going to become a major macroeconomic indicator in the future. Dan? Well, while they were talking, it gave me time to think and make a list. Uh, I don't think that there's a, you know, it's hard to single a, a single one, but I'll just mention a couple. One is, I think, what uh, Dr. Lin just said, basically the threat to GDP, the threat to economic growth that would come from price. And kind of one of the themes I came to the conclusion when I was finishing the quest was this notion of what somebody called, a, Mr. Carnot actually called the Great Revolution, which began with the steam engine, and we constantly have innovations that surprise us. And, I was wanting to hear more from Christina about storage as part of that. So I think that's one. Uh, a second one is political conflict uh, over energy. A third is kind of environmental risks, David, which you've stressed. And then there, there's finally two, there's the energy security issue, the classic energy security issue, which uh, is around, revolves around crises in the Middle East, disruption, regime change, and often we can predict them, but we can only predict them after they happen because they tend to come as surprises. The other one that I think is on the agenda, people know is there, people don't know quite how to deal with it, and I, I hope that we, being the international community, countries, and companies, uh, find a way to address it, is the, uh, what the former CEO of Sony called the bad new world of cyber vulnerability. And I think that's just hanging out there as a threat to, uh, there's no infrastructure that's more critical than energy, and I would put that really um, at the top, uh, among the top risks uh, that we're going to see in the years ahead. Okay. Um, boy, that's a long list, the three of you. You don't sleep very well at night, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have time for one last very brief question, uh, if there is a question from the floor. Uh, right here, sir. While we're waiting for the mic, my answer to the question is cheap oil. All, a lot of things we worry about, like global warming and so on, are going to go out the window if there's very cheap oil in the future. Uh, May Sam Govondo from the uh, United States. Uh, I have a question from uh, Mr. Yergin. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, introductory remarks uh, about uh, Iran and the sanction, and uh, you just mentioned uh, the risk uh, that it uh, imposes. Uh, I was wondering uh, the effect that these sanctions uh, have, which are meant to uh, hurt uh, the Iranian economy, and, uh, but it also has an impact on the rest of the world because the price of oil is now uh, well above what it should be. And uh, we remember uh, not long time ago, uh, the price of oil was like 15 to $20 a barrel, so it creates a great uncertainty. Uh, so the prices may actually go back to those levels and therefore all of these in big investments might be uh, up in the air. Uh, the, and the question is uh, whether you think uh, at some point uh, these risks and these costs to the rest of the world will be uh, demanded uh, from uh, the United States or uh, you think uh, the rest of the world will just absorb these costs as uh, part of the realities of life. Right. What do you think? I think there are two parts to your question. Uh, it is true, uh, when I was writing my book, I went back and looked. In 2004, the absolute consensus was that oil prices uh, would be no higher than $20 and were probably going to collapse from then. And here we are uh, eight years later, and $115 is a price that uh, goes on in the world. Although, as the G7 said about two weeks ago, uh, this is this is actual heavy additional weight for the world economy to carry, and it is in part the result of the tension that surrounds uh, 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 Iran. But the big jump in price, when you look back on it, was really what is price? It's a piece of information, and it told us that the world had changed. It told us that we were not going to be in a world anymore in which the OECD nations dominated energy. Uh, demand, oil demand, but indeed the rise of the emerging markets. And price had a rise to send a, a message both to consumers and to producers uh, that we were in a different world, and it's done that. Uh, as to where the, uh, you know, what, 
I think we've seen, as I said, the G7 with some urgency looked towards the IEA and said the International Energy Agency needs to think about releasing supplies or at least that that should be on the agenda. And I suppose that will be in the agenda. Uh, you know, just yesterday the Saudi oil minister put out a statement saying these prices are too high, they have to come down. So there's a lot of concern around them, uh, but it also reflects the reality is that there is this kind of, let's call it a standoff uh, uh, over Iran's program right now that uh, is, uh, it's sort of on and off the front page, but it's very real and there's a kind of buildup of tension and that tension is reflected in the price and that's kind of goes back to the pre preceding question about what kind of risks are out there. Great, well thank you very much. I think we are at the end of our time, so let me just say very briefly, we have talked about at least three big things today. One of them is innovation. This is it's tremendous what's happening in this business, from batteries to shale gas and so on. It's also tremendous to think about what the potential is for the future, but that's going to require some strategy and vision for innovation, and the role of the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis business uh, in that area. That's a topic that I think the forum could probably do some useful work on. Second is shale gas, clearly a really big deal in North America. Big questions also about how rapidly that and associated technologies scale on the rest of the world, what could be done to accelerate that uh, process. And the third, I think, is this question about nuclear uh, after Fukushima. Um, uh, a year ago, in the immediate aftermath of Fukushima, I think people were very dark about the future of nuclear power, and now we've heard a much more nuanced view. It's not clear what's going to happen in Japan, especially not clear how much uh, uh, Fukushima has actually affected the spread of nuclear power around the world. Uh, certainly, we need to learn the right lessons uh, from the Japanese experience uh, here. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for a terrific discussion. Thank you.